which is great. We have a fantastic session uh, for you this evening. A uh, late addition to our program, we were delighted to have it. Uh, it's uh, Turtle Bunbury is going to talk about Ireland's forgotten past, a history of the overlooked and forgotten. And just to say that at the end, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. If you look at the end of your screen there, there is a Q&A button, and you can click on that and uh, ask your question, and we'll get to as many as we can, uh, as long as Turtle's voice holds out. Uh, we, we'll answer them as best we can. And for those of you who may be tweeting or on social media, our hashtag is HistFest2020. So moving on to our speaker this evening, Turtle Bunbury, who'll be known to many of you. He's a best-selling author, historian, and public speaker. And his latest book, Ireland's Forgotten Past, went straight into the Irish Top Ten bestseller list. And Turtle's next book, uh, The Irish Diaspora, that's going to be out in spring of 2021. And all the information is available on his website at turtlehistory.com. So it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, to the Festival of History, Turtle Bunbury. So over to you, Turtle, and good luck. Thank you, Brendan. Um, well, good evening to you all on this uh, glorious Friday evening. You're very welcome to my first ever uh, Zoom talk. Um, and it is a, an amazing opportunity to discuss history of a Friday evening. So thank you uh, to Brendan and, and Kira and Kate Chandler and to the Dublin Festival of History for inviting me on. Um, my plan is to talk uh, over the course of the next 40 minutes about some of the topics that uh, I uh, discussed in my book, um, which is called Ireland's Forgotten Past, um, uh, which is, as the title suggests, a kind of exploration of some of the lesser known events from Irish history. Um, how far back should we go? Hmm, well, I begin with uh, a tetrapod who was uh, hanging out in Ireland about 385 million years ago. Uh, so I've got about 40 minutes, so that allows me about 9 million years every minute, I've calculated, so I hope you're okay with that. Um, fear not, there will be uh, some of the old stuff here. I will be talking a little bit about Neolithic and Bronze Age people but I hope to gallop as quickly as possible through the Tudors and Georgians, and maybe we'll even get to the 20th century if time permits. Um, the book itself is partly inspired by the glorious countryside where I live in County Carlow. Um, I'm close to the foot of the Wicklow Mountains here, County Wexford, very close by. Uh, just outside my window um, is a, you can sort of see outside my window of my office there, but is a uh, ring fort that is now kind of overgrown with trees, but was once home to seven or eight families, uh, maybe up until the 16th century. If uh, down in the field there, there is a soundless stream that runs down through the field um, to the remains of an ancient monastery. Um, just east of that monastery is a, a dolmen, an amazing 5,000 year old dolmen that I'll show you a picture of in a while. And behind that dolmen is a barley field. And uh, in the glorious summer, a couple of uh, years ago in 2018, uh, a neighbor sent a drone over that barley field and he zoned in on it. And it turned out it was full of uh, ancient barrows and ring ditches and circular enclosures. And uh, suddenly it turned out the barley field had a past. Um, and I think that's what the message I'm trying to sort of dive into here that so many secrets are locked up in the Irish landscape, even, you know, whether it's the streets of Dublin or to the hills and, uh, and countryside all around us, every field, hill, stream, rock has a story to tell. Uh, and that's what I was trying to do to try and sort of uh, stop being so distracted because we're all so distracted that we pass by these things. We pass by ruins all the time and we never really stop to think too much about who lived there or, or what, what was going on. And, in uh, these ancient forts or uh, ancient mills. If you go along the rivers, there's all those ruined mills. Anyway, so this book uh, and the talk I'm gonna talk about this evening is kind of an attempt to uh, find out about some of those people and the events that have been forgotten. The title is A History of the Overlooked and, uh, sorry, the subtitle, A History of the Overlooked and Disremembered, which is a made up -y word. Um, but I just, I wanted a word that captured things that are, are deliberately forgotten, and some things are deliberately forgotten, so it seemed a, a suitable word for that. Um, okay, I'm now going to turn into um, my uh, sharing my screen with um, the slideshow uh, ahead. Um, and we're gonna kick off with, uh, I hope this is fine, is this right? Hang on. Um, the genesis, for want of a better word, the first Irishman. Um, 
I did say we were going to start 385 million years ago. And this uh, chap here is, well, he is as close to a Devonian tetrapod as you're going to get. Uh, and that's the creature that apparently made the footprints you can see on your screen there um, when he pitter-pattered upon this planet about 385 million years ago. Um, and he was about one meter long. And you'll find those footprints down on Valencia Island. Uh, and they are considered amongst the oldest fossils in Ireland. How anybody managed to work out that they're 385 million years old absolutely beats me, but that's what it says on the tin, if you will. Um, and I guess the footprints were made in the same way they do when they lay down fresh tar on a road and the children scampers upon it and you get the footprints in it. I don't know. So, moving forward. We've actually, moving forward, we've just fast forwarded 320 million years already. See, we're flying along. Uh, and we've got to, well, about 66 million years ago, that's when all the non-avian dinosaurs were wiped out by a giant asteroid. Five million years after that, roughly, is when the North Atlantic Ocean is born. And this is, I was trying to get into the landscape for the book to, to kick off the landscape that, we, that surrounds us. And the birth of the, the Atlantic Ocean seemed like a pretty significant event. Um, and it was in Ireland because it caused this uh, swell of scorching hot magma that gushed across parts of the country. It sort of created the mountains of Mourne, for instance, and it brought this volcano. I mean, I didn't even know there was a volcano in Ireland until about four or five years ago, but there is, and you drive through it every time you go to Belfast. Uh, it is what's called the Ring of Gullion on the Louth Armagh border, and it's a massive uh, sort of ring of volcano um, that uh, measured the ring itself as 11 kilometers. The interior is about 37,000 acres. It's so big, we don't even realize it's there. Um, but this is uh, it, it basically a volcano that collapsed. I thought maybe it had erupted, but uh, actually volcanoes uh, generally collapse. Um, and that formed a huge part of our, our landscape. Uh, as you can imagine, it would have been a pretty noisy part of the world to live when this particular one was collapsing. The Giant's Causeway, um, that uh, gorgeous um, uh, uh, coastal feature of basalt columns, again created around the same time by the eruption of uh, Antrim basalt uh, from there. So, okay, we're fast forwarding again, only to only three million years ago now, uh, and this was uh, the end of uh, the, the glaciation sorry, sorry, the start of the glaciation period when uh, Ireland gets smothered under ice. Uh, the sheets, uh, I gather, were somewhere in the region of three kilometers thick. It's so hard to get your head around these sort of uh, statistics, I know. That last ice age comes to an end about 15,000 years ago. And Ireland is this sort of Arctic tundra, the, the glacial meltwaters, uh, perhaps similar to what you're seeing on your screen there, uh, rushing down the mountains and carrying sand and gravel and boulder clay and, and creating the glens and valleys that we know today and some spreading out to form uh, places uh, like the Curra, for instance, which is a, an alluvial plain, 5,000 acres. Uh, but all those other landscapes you see, Connemara, the Burren, all sort of shaped and created at this time. When the meltwater frees up, that uh, means that humans can start arriving. And that's where we're going to go now. The first human, I, incidentally, I should say that the, all the illustrations in, in uh, my book were done by this amazingly talented man, Joe McLaren. Um, and uh, I'm going to be showing a few of his uh, works over the, course of, uh, over the course of the talk. You may be wondering why you're looking at a bear. Um, and that is because the first known human interaction in Ireland, in Irish history, involves a bear. And uh, this was uh, about 13,000 years ago, where this hunter in County Clare, not far from Ennis, confronted a big brown bear with a sharp stone flint uh, in battle or something, and he won. Um, and he dragged the bear to a cave and he smashed it up to eat it. Uh, and he particularly went for the knee bones on the bear because that had very high protein marrow. How do we know this? Because uh, they found the knee patella. Uh, in the cave, uh, which, which is just, as I say, just north of Ennis. 
uh, and that um, the fact that it had man-made cuts on it are uh, presently regarded as the earliest conclusive evidence of mankind in Ireland, uh, as I say, about 11 and a half thousand BC. We move forward 8,000 years ago, the first Mesolithic hunters, uh, the gatherers, they start appearing around the coast of Ireland um, in places like Mount Sandal, that's up in uh, near Coleraine, uh, Dunmore, Eastern County, Waterford, Bally Ferreter near Dingle, uh, also up in the Blackwater Valley. Uh, and they're clearing settlements in the primeval woods and, and creating the first, uh, as I say, human settlements in Ireland. It's very hard to get your head around what these people were. This is 8,000 years ago. If you uh, calculate that there's uh, 30 generations every 1,000 years, you're talking 240 years, unless my maths is completely out. Um, uh, so we don't really know very much about them at all. They're apparently shorter than us. It, um, certainly they lived uh, much shorter lives. They maybe got to 40 years old if they were lucky. Uh, they uh, were dark-skinned, uh, blue-eyed, maybe. I mean, you know, these are all speculations, but they had their own fully-fledged language, uh, is uh, what the, uh, the experts will tell you. Uh, it would be absolutely incomprehensible to modern ears, although I've been to a few pubs in my time where I suspect that they were speaking that language towards the tail end of the night. Um, they, as I say, very little is, is known about them. Um, they did find some eagle feathers up at Mount Sandal, which I think is quite tantalizing. There's a theory that they wore uh, these eagle feathers in their ceremonial headdress. I don't know, maybe. There is so much emptiness and speculation to try and uh, work out with these guys. They were in turn replaced by the Neolithic people, who we know a little bit more about, not much, but they did at least leave us these incredible uh, man-made monuments. And I love the Neolithic people. And you know, if, if ever there's an aspect of forgotten Ireland, um, it, it is to an extent the, the, the megaliths that these guys have left. There's at least 1,500 of them surviving today. And I have little doubt that there were thousands more uh, before they were you know, pulled down by farmers and, and the church and, and, and battles and all the other things that have happened. These, uh, the one you're looking at there is Joe McLaren's illustration of the Browns Hill Dolmen, uh, which is just outside Carlo Town. Um, and it is a monster, uh, of a, it's a burial chamber for those who don't know, Dolmen, D-O-L-M-E-N. Um, and it's a megalithic dolmen um, from uh, about four and a half, five thousand 5,000 BC. The capstone, the top stone is 103 tons which is the same weight as a Boeing 757 or 17 fully grown Indian elephants. Um, I was in touch with various members of the Leinster rugby team about how many people it would take to push such a thing and they were defeated. They said, you know, they just couldn't see how it could be done. Even if you've got a hundred Super Bowl players and a hundred, you know, rugby players to push and heave, they couldn't see how you could move 103 tons. It's, as I say, one, that's the, the, the biggest in Ireland, the capstone, but there's 180 of those around the country. The Neolithics were amazing at all sorts of other things. Many of the uh, megaliths they did were aligned with the solstice or the equinox, uh, like these guys here, the Ectocura stones down in Kerry. Um, they, uh, others, fizzle with static electricity. They kind of, they were clocks to an extent. They're the world's oldest clocks. Um, and they would tell you the time of uh, day, if not, sorry, the time of year, if not the time of day. Um, the pièce de résistance is, uh, of course, Newgrange in County Meath, which really is amazing because the sun, that's a 90, what you're looking at that there is a 19 meter damp proof passageway. And the sun rises up on the winter solstice, the 21st of December, and a beam widens as it goes down and it goes all the way down and strikes this triple motif, a Celtic sort of spirally motif, and illuminates the central chamber for about 14 minutes. Uh, and it does that on the 21st of December, a little bit on the 20th, a little bit on the 22nd of December. And it's been doing that little trick for 5,200 years. Pretty good going. Uh, we are still constantly finding out new information about this because we're getting better at trying to figure out how to find that information. So for instance, in <clears throat> early this year, a study uh, revealed that the were relatives of a man buried at Newgrange, which is in County Meads, just north of Dublin, were found in passage tombs at Carrow Moor and Carrow Keel, which is 150 kilometers uh, west in County Sligo. So, you know, how, how we work out these sort of things. 
Um, and in fact, when, when I mentioned earlier the, uh, the great hot summer of 2018, that what you're looking at there is the outline of uh, still more uh, evidence of things that's just beside Newgrange. So there's still plenty more to discover about that. Um, and about the Neolithics themselves and their mystery. Where did they come from? Possibly Galicia in Spain, maybe Brittany in France. Um, they came of age in uh, the time of an agricultural revolution that was uh, kicking off all across what was called the Fertile Crescent of the, of the Middle East about 10,000 years ago. And it gradually inched its way across Europe to Ireland. Um, and certainly what we know of them, they have these most amazing energy saving uh, devices and innovations that they were bringing in. Well, they knew about pack animals. Maybe they'd thought of a pack animal before to carry sort of hefty weights. Um, and they went more mining for something called porcelainite, which is this very uh, China-like stone um, that is much tougher than flint uh, and ideal for axes and sickles and digging implements and so on. Um, some of you may have been to the Cady Fields uh, on North Mayo, on the cliff edge of North Mayo there. Uh, which is a series of stone walls and the outline of a very efficiently planned dairy farm, 3,000 acres big, uh, again, that was operational perhaps as far back as 3000 BC. Amazing people. I would not uh, want to pick a fight with someone from the Neolithic age. A scientific analysis of arm bones belonging to Neolithic women from Central Europe indicated that they were between 11 and 16% more muscular than Cambridge University's female rowing crew. Okay. <clears throat> uh, oh, sorry, there is, that's the beautiful dolmen that is literally just uh, a mile down the road from where I live, absolutely gorgeous. And that, I mentioned the drone going over the field just behind the dolmen, is our, the barley field I was talking about. And hopefully you can see the outline of all the rings um, in that field. But uh, you know, amazing discovery to, to have so close to, to where I live. Um, on Tuesday last, I took uh, our daughters to see a, uh, a hill about 20 minutes south of here that turns out to be one of the biggest Bronze Age burial sites in Ireland. Um, the Neolithic Age, uh, which we've just been dealing with, that came to an abrupt halt around about 2400 BC, and the population seems to have plunged by a whopping 90%. What happened? We're unsure, maybe plague, maybe genocide. Um, it is perhaps a, no coincidence that it coincides with the arrival of a new people uh, to Ireland known as the Bell Beakers. Um, again, they maybe have came from Portugal. Nobody's quite sure where they came from. Portugal seems the front runner. Uh, and they were geniuses at working with copper and bronze and gold. And they had a fondness for very good beer too. Um, copper was their big thing. Uh, and uh, because they realized that axes and knives that are made out of copper are much more effective and durable than porcelainite, which I was telling you about, or stone or anything. Uh, and so they started uh, um, establishing all these mines. They established the earliest one was at Ross Island down in Kerry. They later did one, if you've been down uh, by Skull, you might know Mount Gabriel. And they have a copper mine there uh, into which they cut 25 mine shafts into the hill. Um, and fires were lit against the face of each shaft. Pots of water were then hurled on the scorched rock, causing it to shatter before the laborers advanced with cobble scoops and stone hammers to draw the copper out. Anyway, they were at this game all across the country, up at the, at the Allahies in the Bear, at Bonmahan in Waterford, at Avoca in Wicklow, somewhere in the region of 370 tonnes of finished copper uh, is apparent, was uh, said to have been produced in Irish mines over the course of this time. And what you end up with is um, most, uh, more Bronze Age, uh, well, they were mad into the gold as well, but more Bronze Age gold hoards have been found in Ireland than anywhere else on earth, including eight gold lunuli, which is what you're looking at there. And that was the must have trinket of the uh, late third century, uh, third millennium rather, BC. Um, I'm not sure if it will uh, get a comeback. It kind of does get a comeback every now and then. It's probably due one right about now. Okay, so um, there is lots in the book about that whole era. It's not quite a historian's territory. It's more an archaeologist's territory, but uh, I find it absolutely fascinating to sort of step into it. And I went in a little bit more and looking at um, the old bog roads. That's one up in West Meath. These are the roads that the chariots used to race upon and, you know, the Celtic chariots in the roundabout the time of 
Jesus Christ, you know, that sort of era. Um, and that leads us neatly on to the Romans. And what did the Romans ever do for us? Um, <clears throat> the, they never conquered Ireland, uh, but they certainly thought about it. Um, in 60 AD, which is uh, about or a little under two decades after the Roman conquest of uh, Celtic Britain, uh, Gaius Suetonius Paulinus, who was the governor of the new province of, of Britain, he wiped out the Druids um, in Wales, and he, he, that brought him all the way to what was a, a sacred island called Mona. It's now known as Anglesey, uh, where the Hollyhead fer Ferry pulls into. Uh, and he brought about 20,000 legionaries across there on behalf of his dastardly emperor, Nero. Uh, and as I say, he, he wiped out all the Druids and he was all set actually to, to go another 70 miles across the Irish Sea to Ireland. Mm. <clears throat> or uh, the island that they called um, Hibernia, the land of winter. And, and Pompon a guy called Pomponius Mela, who's a contemporary of Paulinus, he didn't think much of the Irish. He described them as a people wanting in every virtue and totally destitute of piety. But they quite liked the sound of Ireland because it was uh, said to be a country so luxuriant in grasses that if cattle were allowed to feed too long, they would burst. Anyway, Paulinus, uh, who's the governor, he uh, had to call off his plans to invade Ireland if he actually ever had these plans um, because he learned that Boudicca, the famous queen of the Iceni, had uh, seized the opportunity when he was away in Wales. She said, well, now's the time for my major rebellion back in Southeast England, so he had to about turn his army and skedaddle back there to resolve the situation. And as I said, the Romans never conquered Ireland uh, and they never really tried. They did about 20 years after Paulinus, um, Agricola, another governor, uh, apparently eyeballed the north coast of Ulster um, from Galloway and declared that he could have conquered and occupied Ireland with a single legion and a few auxiliaries. I'm not so sure. Anyway, some Archaeologists have suggested that Agricola established uh, a sort of fort at uh, Dramana, uh, which juts out into, it's, there is a fort there, it juts out into the sea, into the Irish Sea near Rush, about 20 k's north of Dublin. Um, and it could have been some form of Roman trading depot. They've found Roman coins and metalwork and tableware at the fort and, and fragments of pottery that uh, come from Andalusia in Spain. Um, and there was certainly, Romans were certainly trading with Ireland. They were exchanging metal and cattle and grain. Animal hides was a big thing. Uh, and hunting dogs as well, actually. Um, and you find um, Roman coins and jewellery all across the country, places like Tara, Cashel, Newgrange, which we mentioned. Um, hordes have been found up in Coleraine in, on the north, uh, at Three Rock Mountains of Rathfarnham, Down Patrick, Brayhead, even down in Cork Harbour. I mean, the thing is, Rome ran Western Europe for nearly 400 years. So it's no big surprise, uh, you know, that they would be sort of trading in Ireland. I mean, that's as if Europe today had been run by the same people since 1620. You know, I think it would have affected our trade over the last 400 years. So there was uh, undoubtedly Roman links here. There is also a certain amount of chin stroking over a Roman style cremation that uh, took place at Stonyford in County Kilkenny in the first century AD. Um, their uh, failure, uh, the Romans, they never, they never um, conquered Ireland, so they never controlled the Irish Sea, and that meant that uh, the pirates were always on the go. Uh, and their big thing was to, to capture people, which they sold into slavery. Um, uh, and uh, quite a lot of the villa-owning elite in Rome, after the decline of um, the Roman Britain, the Roman legions left Britain, uh, it wasn't a very good time for the Roman elite or what who had been the Roman elite, and a lot of them were, were captured. Certain ones who lived by the coast were in trouble. Amongst them, the most famous of them all was St. Patrick, um, who was reputedly the son of a Roman uh, decurion or tax collector living on the coast when he was captured by uh, Irish pirates. Uh, I'm not going to go into uh, the whole St. Patrick story here, um, but I do tackle it a, a little bit in the book and how his greatest cha challenge uh, as, a, as a Christian missionary was to bring um, an end to the age of Druids um, who had uh, kind of been in the ascendance um, in Ireland since the late Iron Age. And in a way, their deep roots of, of Druidism, I do think, stretch back to the uh, architects of those Neolithic, megalithic passage graves and dolmens and things that we talked about earlier. 
Okay, I better fast forward. I'm only at the Romans. Okay, so we've gone through the Mesolithic, the, Mesolithic, the Neolithic, a little bit on the Celtics, a little bit on the Romans. The Christians, well, you know, that was the biggest legacy of the Romans was the Christianity or the, the Roman Catholic Church that it gave rise to. Uh, and, you know, much of the knowledge and learning that was gathered during the Roman age would in turn be preserved by uh, monasteries all across Ireland during the 5th, 6th, 7th centuries. And you find these ruined monasteries all, you know, generally along rivers. And this, you know, they're just completely abandoned. There are places you read the small signs, they'll tell you a thousand uh, people were once students here at one time. You're like, Ooh. Uh, and they're also, you know, incredible artistic, uh, uh, incredibly artistic people, the Celtic crosses. I, I do a chapter about the Celtic crosses. Um, in uh, the book, uh, which lead on to, when I mean, there's another one, the, the famous one at Con McNoise, but they are works of incredible uh, art. Um, and they also served a purpose. Um, I don't know if you can see this one clearly enough, but it's one that, uh, uh, one of the panels that appears on an awful lot of high crosses around the country. And it depicts uh, the moment when Abraham was planning to kill his only son, Isaac, as a sacrifice to uh, God when the angel of the Lord appeared, one of the angels, and said, don't do that, Abraham, you don't need to. Um, why don't you kill this lamb instead? It wasn't a great day for the lamb. Um, but my uh, sort of amateur interpretation of this is that this was uh, some way of bringing advertising Christianity as, as a religion that uh, was not about human sacrifice. And this was something, human sacrifice had been practiced by many of the people who had been in Ireland before. Uh, you know, before Christianity. So that was one of the big selling points. You don't have to kill, you know, the people you love in order to uh, appease your God. Okay, uh, I'm not gonna go through the Kings of Leinster. There is a chapter on the Kings of Leinster and these uh, amazing uh, people in the book. Again, it's quite hard to get your uh, head around all the different warring tribes who were battling for um, the, the kingdoms at, at that time. But uh, once you drill into it, it does slowly start to make sense. And then you, in turn, get to make sense of the amazing ring forts that are around and about, which were, you know, the, the trophy forts of, of whoever became the king in those times. <clears throat> the Vikings, uh, Dublin, of course, uh, being the Viking city and Nor Norse Viking city, we now know for sure. Um, and, you know, we often forget how much influence the Vikings had over us. I mean, they were uh, a dominant force for the guts of 400 years. Um, so, you know, the, the legacy is enormous, I think, of them, uh, the days of the week, and, and uh, Friday and Thor's Day and so forth. Um, Dublin was, as I say, established by uh, Norse Vikings or Ostmen, men of the East, uh, in 841 by a guy called Thorgill, and it was part of this massive um, regional power block uh, that extended up the west coast of Scotland and northern England. It took in the Isle of Man, it took in the Hebrides, the Orkneys, sometimes all the way up to Norway, where uh, you know, they found plenty of Irish metalwork in Viking graves, uh, taken away by uh, longboats like this one, perhaps, um, uh, which was uh, probably plunder, but possibly uh, merchandise, who knows. Uh, the point is that Dublin became a very wealthy port on the Vikings' watch, uh, not least as a holding depot for slaves. Um, and you will find that all up around Dame Street, Temple Bar, Dublin Castle, all around there. Um, I have, a, in the book, I focused on a guy called Citric Silkbeard. He's one of my favorite kings. Um, he became king in 993, which is about 150 years after the city was founded. Uh, his grandfather had been a, quite a successful king. His father had been king too, but not quite so successfully. In fact, uh, the, the city was captured uh, and conquered by an enemy king. But anyway, Citric got it back and he ruled as king of Dublin for 46 years, which is a pretty amazing uh, run in those days. Uh, he founded uh, Ireland's first mint in Dublin and we find coins from that every now and then. Uh, he kick-started the city's first stone wall probably by enlarging uh, a series of pre-existing timber walls uh, and earth banks. Um, and he made this amazing pilgrimage to Rome and returned via Cologne. And on the, the upshot of all that was he founded Christchurch Cathedral. He met these Benedictine monks in, in, in Cologne and they were kind of part and parcel of the foundation of Christchurch, which, uh, you know, what that meant was that he was converting Dublin from a pagan city into a Christian one. Um, his reign coincided with that of Brian Boru, uh, you know, the, the most famous uh, high king in Irish history. 
uh, who was his enemy. Uh, he destroyed uh, Citrix army once upon a time. It was a strange peace process in which Brian Brew um, uh, married uh, Citrix's mum and Citric married Brian Brew's daughter. It's very hard to get your head around. It's very Westeros. Um, anyway, uh, Citric then was sort of in, in, in cahoots with Brian Brew for a while and Dublin prospered and certainly, in fact, there was excavations earlier this year on Ship Street in Dublin uh, that revealed that Dovlin, uh, the pool on the River Poddle where the Vikings first settled, was actually much bigger than originally uh, thought and it tallies with contemporary reports. That the Dovlin, that, that uh, pond, uh, could hold up to 200 longships. So it was, you know, we're still learning about this whole era. Anyway, you probably know that uh, Citric and, um, and um, Brian Brew had such a big fallout that it ended up with a big battle on uh, Clontarf on Good Friday 1014 and uh, Brian Brew was killed. Um, Citric actually, he stood very far back from the uh, sidelines, so he was fine. He survived and lived on to be king for another 30 years. Um, anyway, look, his story is told in the book. I think he's a pretty fascinating guy, certainly if you are from Dublin. Um, we are, <laughs> we're already running out of time. I'm just getting to the Norman age. Um, <clears throat> the Normans, uh, it's 850 years since the Normans uh, rocked up in Ireland. The first main batch came in May 1169, the next lot in May 1170. Their legacy is all around us, um, in ruins mainly, but they brought in, you know, rabbits um, for fur, and uh, pheasants, and frogs, and fallow deer, which they like to eat, uh, apples, or new types of apple trees, peaches, beech trees, they brought in new breeds of sheep. They brought in feudalism. They brought in the tax system. They brought in the parish system. They brought in, you know, the very early form of the English language. They held the first parliament in Ireland. They did so much. Uh, for me, what I've focused on in this book is a really interesting aspect of the Norman story, which is the Knights Templar, because they were so mysterious and everybody uh, loves that story. For those who don't know them, they were this uber wealthy military order that was founded in Jerusalem to protect pilgrims who were being mugged and murdered uh, when they were trying to head into the holy city of Jerusalem, which uh, Jerusalem was a, a Norman city at this time. Um, anyway, they, uh, the, the Templars end up being pretty influential in Ireland. They owned um, a huge chunk of what's called the Hook Peninsula in County Wexford, uh, and they had uh, preceptories or, or estates all over Ireland, including Clontarf and, and Crook, uh, all across Munster, Leinster, as far west as a place called Temple House in County Sligo. And they used these estates to raise agriculture and rents, which would fund their campaigns in the Holy Land. Um, so pretty amazing. They, they also sort of bred horses and developed a, a, a woolen industry there. Um, they came a cropper on the original Black Friday, Friday the 13th of October, uh, the original unlucky Friday the 13th, uh, in 1307, uh, when they were purged overnight by, well, the King of France teamed up with the Pope. And anyway, in Ireland, they arrested um, 20 of the Knights Templar and brought them off for a a four-month inquisition in St. Patrick's Cathedral, which I talk about in the book. And it was a pretty murky, hideous time for them. Um, sorry, that's uh, Aoife and Dermot and the, the whole thing. There is a Mike Templar looking suspiciously like Russell Crowe. Um, they built, as I say, castles galore, Carlo Castle, my local castle was built on their watch, and this other amazing one, Castle Roach, in the middle of nowhere on the Louth Armagh border. I uh, strongly recommend you head up and visit. Um, uh, the Edward the Bruce, I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm forwarding through quite hastily, but it is uh, the medieval period I wanted to sort of touch on. Edward the Bruce's invasion of Ireland. If you go to the north of Dublin um, in uh, Fochert, uh, you find this grave, Edward Bruce, King of Ireland, killed in the Battle of Fochert back in 1318, which is an amazing thing if he really is there. He's not all there, I have to say, because he was hung, drawn and quartered. So. Uh, various quarters of them are in other parts of uh, what was then the Kingdom of England and Ireland. Anyway, I talk about, he was the brother of Robert the Bruce and it's all Braveheart, William Wallace, that whole era. Uh, and pretty exciting to, to sort of uh, confront uh, what happened during that strange time. Um, it leads us through to the Wars of the Roses, which is uh, an event every child learns about in England, but very few in Ireland. And yet it took place all across Ireland and there are uh, battlefields and, and remnants of it everywhere. If you go into St. Patrick's Cathedral, you will find the door, a famous door, where um, a guy called James Dove Butler, who was 
for one of the warring sides um, in, in, the, um, in the Wars of the Roses, he met his enemy, Lord Kildare, and he put his hand through that uh, door, a, a hole that was, uh, was a chancel door, I think it's called, in the cathedral. And that uh, was a sort of handshake of trust that gave rise to the expression to chance uh, one's arm. Okay, um, we, are, we are so out of time, <laughs> and I've got to the Tudors. There you go. How do you tell the history of Ireland in such a short time? I do not know. The Tudors uh, were massive in Ireland. I have uh, focused my story on a guy who became the enemy of this lady, uh, that's Queen Elizabeth, um, and his name was Sir William Stanley, and he was uh, actually an Englishman who um, commanded um, Elizabeth's forces in Ireland, um, but he would then felt very short change because uh, he didn't get any uh, of the land when they were divvying it up afterwards. Uh, for instance, Walter Raleigh got 42,000 acres as a prize, where Wal William Stanley, who'd done a lot to, to capture Munster for her, um, was given nothing. So he ended up changing sides and he went and joined the Spanish. And so I talk about him and his role in the Spanish Armada, which eventually came a cropper, mostly on the coast of Ireland. Um, so really very exciting stuff. If you like your Tudor period, there is no shortage of uh, excellent stories about uh, the Tudors in Ireland. How are we doing? We're into the last uh, three or four minutes, I think. Mm. I had to put in uh, a picture of James VI of Scotland, who, as it says there, became James I. He succeeded Queen Elizabeth. I had to put the picture in because I like his hat. I think it's a very fine hat. Um, he um, became king uh, in 1603 of Ireland, and it was under him that the plantations began. So I've gone into the stories of the plantations a little bit, uh, because I think that is an extremely important aspect of our history. Um, you can see uh, there's a map there detailing how it, how it all worked out. Um, but huge chunks of Ireland taken over between 1556 and you know, the 1620. Um, uh, I've told the story through the, uh, the life of a guy called Daniel Byrne, who's a great grandson of Fief McHugh O'Byrne, who was a, one of the Queen Elizabeth's enemies. Um, and he was a Catholic tailor who worked upside Christ Church Cathedral. Um, and he brought huge amounts of white cloth in Dublin and he had it colored red, dyed it all red. And then he got 40 tailors, apprentice tailors. He employed them all up beside Christ Church and they turned it into red coat uniforms for no less an army than Oliver Cromwell's uh, new model army, 43,000 men that Oliver Cromwell got over and they were kitted out in um, this, uh, the, the white cloth dyed red by Oliver Byrne. And that's the origin of the Redcoats. Um, so I kind of honed in on that story. Um, okay, Whoop. Georgian Ireland. Joshua Dawson, Dawson Street, because you're all Dubliners, uh, you should know the story about Joshua Dawson, um, who was the number one spy master. He's the guy who built the mansion house. Dawson Street's name for him, so it was Joshua Street just off it. Uh, he was the number one spy master in Ireland in about 1700 to 1713. Uh, very little known story, but a pretty remarkable, remarkable guy. This was the time of the penal laws, not a great time to be a Catholic in Ireland. Uh, his job was to uh, get rid of all Catholic priests and anybody else that was suspe uh, suspected of um, you know, being devious. Okay, oh, all these stories, so many stories. The Hellfire Club, I'd love to tell you the story of the Hellfire Club. We couldn't possibly go into it here. Or Peg Plunkett. Um, who was uh, regarded as uh, the Dublin city's foremost courtesan and brothel queen, uh, queen in uh, the uh, 1780s, 1790s. Uh, she uh, caused a serious rumpus in 1794 when word got out that she was preparing her memoirs for publication uh, and that she was planning to name uh, all the various people who had been her customers and who hadn't paid her because a lot of people hadn't paid up. Uh, anyway, she was a really remarkable woman, and I have a, a big soft spot for her. Uh, her uh, a place of um, that she was based is um, now uh, the Westbury Hotel. So uh, if you go to the Westbury Hotel, you should read about uh, Mrs. Leeson, as she was sometimes known, or Peg Plunkett. Um, I, uh, into the final minute, I presume at this stage, um, we, uh, I bring it up to the story of the Congested District Board, which sounds like incredibly boring. Um, but this was uh, a very ambitious plan by the Conservative government in Britain, who ruled Britain for about 10, 12 years, 
um, to kill home rule with kindness. And they spent an absolute fortune uh, in Ireland building um, all sorts of things, piers uh, and, and uh, all along the coastline, uh, viaducts bringing the railways out into the west of Ireland. Um, they're buying fishing fleets for all the fishermen out in the west, um, building lighthouses, uh, new bridges, new roads, drainage schemes, incredibly uh, enterprising time. Um, and I, I've gone into that because I just think it's too, too fascinating. And we don't really know about it. And yet uh, a lot of the roads and railways and all that that we use every day uh, were constructed during that time. Um, I talk about the gas attack in the Western Front, which uh, left a lot of uh, Dubliners dead. In fact, it killed more Dublin uh, soldiers in one day in the same week as the Easter Rising. Uh, than, than people who died in the Easter Rising. Probably, that probably didn't make sense. I'll explain it again another day. Um, finally, my last story is about Operation Shamrock, uh, which was this extraordinary um, Red Cross humanitarian initiative at the end of the Second World War. You might, if you walk through Stephen's Green, you'll see that monument that Joe McLaren has depicted there. Uh, and the initiative was to bring German children from war-torn, uh, from the war-torn German homeland to Ireland to enjoy some peace after the war, because they're obviously all traumatized. Um, and that story is told through a lovely guy called Herbert Remmel, who's still alive. He came here when he was nine years old, uh, and he got off the mail boat in Dunleary in 1946 with um, all the other young children that were being brought over. And uh, people were giving them fruit and everything, and he just turned around. He was so mesmerized, and he sank his teeth into an orange. Uh, and peeling, peeling an orange was one of the uh, very useful things that he learned in Ireland. Okay, I think I better uh, wrap up there. And uh, if you have uh, any questions, I am game on. Okay, folks. Well, <laughs> thank you very much, Turtle. That was earlier whistle stop tour. Uh, maybe would you mind uh, on share uh, on sharing your uh, screen? Of course. Yeah. Right. Yep. So uh, that's great. Here now. Uh, thanks very much. Excellent. <laughs> uh, that, as I say, a whistle stop tour of Irish history well, and uh, yeah. reminding me of so many places I haven't been actually, uh, even in around Dublin. But uh, uh, before we go to the questions, just to say that uh, with the Viking connection, we actually are planning one of my other jobs in the City Council is uh, around commemorations. And we're erecting a commemorative plaque on Fishamble Street uh, to mark where uh, St. Olaf's Church uh, was located on Fishamble Street around about from, I think, around 1200 into the 1400s. And of course, St. Olaf is the patron saint of Norway. Uh, so that's a direct uh, connection between the uh, Norse, the Norse who uh, settled Dublin, as you say, and they had plenty of places of worship around the city. And we're going to mark this particular place, uh, St. Olaf's, on Fishamble Street, uh, hopefully by, by, by the end of the year. Brilliant. We, we okay, yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's interesting, you know. Mm. Uh, I won't just digress quickly. We had a, an ambassador from Norway the last couple of years. She was absolutely obsessed with the connections between Norway and Dublin. And uh, she's a great loss. She's gone to Estonia now. Uh, but uh, she, she, we, we were able to build links between Dublin and Norway through that. So let's go to the questions. Uh, Adrian B says, Turtle, absolutely fascinating. What gave you the idea of writing this book? Well, now, um, I have actually been um, sort of giving talks and tours around Ireland for sort of 10, 15 years. Um, and uh, so I've always been gathering these stories. Um, and then um, the, a publisher, Thames and Hudson, um, who I've worked with before, I did a book on the Irish pub with them about eight or nine years ago. Um, and they said, have you got any books up your sleeve? And I said, well, this would be absolutely perfect opportunity to kind of I wasn't quite sure what it was going to be, and it does. It starts out as a as a history of Ireland, uh, and then um, you know, and it certainly tells the first few chapters are all very chronologically uh, based. But then it kind of turns into a story of all the all these lesser known characters and people and stories. So I don't know. It's a it's a reasonably thin book, um, and I have a funny feeling that it could have been a lot thicker. So, but if your talk is anything to go by, I think I think you're right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Fiona asks, uh, Turtle, is there any evidence of the Hansa having a presence here? I presume the Hansa being the, the Hanseatic League, the North German uh, merchant uh, in the Middle Ages. Um, I am um, not, not that I have come across, but I have not looked for it. Wouldn't surprise me. 
uh, you know, I think everything is much more maritime than we than we uh, realize in those days. It really was. And the trade links between, I mean, even, you know, Viking uh, Cork, for instance, was trading uh, with France quite a lot. And, you know, I mean, if you if you go to the Viking network, you know, their their trade links are all around Europe. Uh, the Normans the same. I mentioned that the Normans briefly owned, you know, the kingdom of Jerusalem. So they were all, with, all the way down there. And you have got, you know, the same people that are going on crusade. The Knights Templar that I mentioned earlier, a lot of them were retired warriors who would have done their tour of duty uh, in the Holy Land. You know, and they would have been down in places like that. Um, and definitely, you know, a lot of, there was a lot more movement around uh, than uh, I think we sometimes give credit to. But I don't know. I mean, sir, that's a slightly waffly answer. I don't know about the Hanseatic League. Okay, thanks. Uh, anonymous attendee says, is the Norman Castle on the Louth Armagh border the one you see from the train between Dublin and Belfast? No, I don't think you would, you can't see it from anywhere. Um, it is called uh, Rohisha's Castle and it's absolutely brilliant. Um, uh, it's, li it's literally in the middle of nowhere and it was a sort of a border post on the, the border of the Pale as was. And uh, it was built by, uh, unusually, by a woman called Rohistia de Verdon. Um, and uh, the story is that uh, she uh, was a very rich heiress and that she offered to marry whoever built uh, the castle for her. Um, and uh, that she then, uh, there's the thing called the, the murder window, because apparently she brought her, she married the guy, then brought him up to admire the view from the top story of the castle and allegedly heaved him out the window. I, I, I think, uh, sadly, I think this story is, uh, or no, actually not sadly, but I, I think this story is not uh, true, but it's a fabulous castle um, and it is, you cannot see it from the railway. There is a castle uh, with a tower house uh, in around Balbriggan, which you can see from the, uh, the railway line. That may be, that may be the one. Right. Mm. Uh, Michelle asks, are there any Irish women featured in your book? Um, yes, there are. Well, I mean, I've just mentioned uh, Rohisha there. Um, and, you know, the, the story of women is reasonably hard to find in the uh, annals uh, traditionally. Um, Mrs. Plunkett, I have I've told her story. Um, there is another lady called Nellie Clifton, uh, who turns up in a, a, as the central figure in a, in a story about the, uh, the Prince of Wales um, uh, and his time at the Curra in County Kildare. Um, I, I also tell the story of the Night of the Big Wind, um, which uh, came along in 1839 and uh, caused, made more people homeless in a single night than all the sort of sorry decades of eviction that followed. It was an extraordinary time. Um, anyway, um, sadly, quite a lot of ladies feature in that. Um, but uh, I mean, I think quite a good example of how women get. Uh, treated in history is actually Citric Silkbeard's mother, who I, I briefly mentioned Citric Silkbeard, the King of Dublin, uh, Gorham Fliat, I can never say her name, but she was uh, married off to uh, Brian Baru, uh, and the annals would subsequently blame the entire war on her um, uh, in the sort of spirit of uh, male analysts. <laughs> uh, so I have, I do, I do talk about women, not enough women. I will do, there'll be a lot more women in my book about the Irish diaspora. Uh, the comment more, more than a question before says, uh, uh, this person says, I often look at Dawson Street and Mansion House to Georgian Squares and think, well, we do have something to thank the British for, I guess. I suppose, oh, Dawson, was Dawson English? Uh, uh, he was, uh, he was English, his uh, as in his father had, was he, I think he was born in Ireland, but his father had come yeah. over from the Lake District in England, and uh, yeah. they have a place up in Loch Ney, up in the north. Um, of course, the mansion house, as I say, well, it was actually the first mansion house, uh, well, Newcastle, I think, was just slightly ahead of it. We were ahead of, of London, certainly, so, you know, it's one of the, the first mayoral homes uh, mm. in the British Isles. Uh, Hogan McGee says, very entertaining as usual. Thank you, uh, Turtle. And somebody else asked, would you consider making a children's version? Um, of course, yes. It'd be quite fun, wouldn't it? Yeah, you could do that with, with Joe McLaren's illustrations. I certainly would. Okay. Uh, Cataldo Bale says, are the Huguenots forgotten? And what part of Irish history would you wish to inspire your grandchildren? Just looking ahead. <laughs> well, in a way, one would say one hopes that the years 2016 to 2020 will be forgotten. <laughs> uh, 
Anyway, uh, the Huguenots are, um, no, the Huguenots are not forgotten and they are worthy of a book in themselves. And I have given talks about the Huguenots before and they're a really extraordinary uh, group of people. They were uh, French emigres, uh, exiles, religious exiles who came here and their impact is massive all around us. Uh, it, I mean, a lot of them are bankers, so the Bank of Ireland started off as Huguenot. James Gandon, who built the Custom House and the Four Courts, he was you know, of Huguenot origin. Even Wolf Tone, I think, of, is, is of Huguenot origin. Um, so, yes, they are uh, a neglected subject. The Huguenot Cemetery on, off, off Bagot Street is uh, something, you know, that has its own sort of faint mystery. Um, uh, and they are lightly touched upon in this book, but hopefully uh, more so in a future one. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Brian Cleary says, uh, glad you could join us, Brian. I, I know it's a bit of a problem with logging in. Glad, you, glad you're able to make it. Uh, you wrote a great piece about Bartholomew Moss. Yeah. Uh, where can a reader get more detail especially around his travels in Europe. Yeah, Bartholomew Moss is, is an extraordinary chap who was born in Port Leash um, and uh, ended up, he was a barber surgeon as a young man and he got married and his wife, who he loved, died in childbirth and um, giving birth to the baby. The baby also died. And almost at, at that moment, he decided to dedicate his life to midwifery and became a midwife, which is a very frowned upon profession for a man to become a midwife in the 1740s. And so, yes, he traveled around Europe and, and learned his uh, craft in, in, in Paris and various other places and ended up coming back to Dublin and founding the Rotunda, uh, basically the world's first purpose-built maternity hospital. It's an extraordinary legacy to have. Um, I did, uh, I've written about uh, him uh, and that story can be found on my website, turtlebunbury.com. Uh, and there's a sort of Google search option in the top right. Put in Moss, M-O-S-S-E, and you'll find him. Great. Well, just to say, we don't mind me saying, uh, we actually, another commemorative plaque, which we plan on erecting, is on the original site of uh, Moss's original uh, hospital, which is on uh, what is now the corner of Fade Street and Georgia Street on the south side. And we hope to erect that plaque. Uh, it's been proposed by the Rotunda. And it's something I wasn't aware of, so I'd like to find that out. And that, that again, there, there'll be another plaque we erect by the end of the year. So another question now from Yvonne. Uh, what was your favourite story that you uncovered when writing the book? Woo! <laughs> um, gosh, there were quite a lot. I'm just looking down to see. I mean, I definitely, I definitely got a bit of a thrill out of bringing um, sort of medieval Ireland to life. Um, I think, uh, and then there's other sort of little bits of geography as well. When you find out there's these canals down in, in Kerry, the Lixnor canals that have been sort of overgrown down there, and finding the story about them and these sort of projects. Um, the hmm. And the night of the big wind is something that has an enormous impact, really, because it just, you know, when you read the newspaper accounts from it, uh, you can just see how absolutely terrifying that might be. And uh, I do, I, I wrote a story about it for the Irish Times a few years ago, and they, it gets aired every time there's a glimpse of a hurricane, it seems to appear again. Um, but uh, I think possibly the night of the big wind might be up there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Maureen says, uh, sounds a very uh, engaging and interesting book. Where can we get it? Well, you can get it uh, from our festival uh, book, bookshop partners at gutterbookshop.com uh, or uh, I'm sure most bookshops will be able to have it. And I'm sure if you check your local library, they should have a, a, have a copy as well. I, sh I should hope so, at least. Uh, Michelle says, thank you very much for an uh, interesting overview. Look forward to your book on the diaspora and uh, so say all of us. Uh, Claire Hayes says, Turtle, have you heard of Maggie Chu, Lady of Espionage and Drug Merchant? landing in Limerick in the 1920s to feature in second edition, maybe, question mark. I have not. I'm so pleased to hear of somebody that I haven't heard of before. How very exciting. No, I'd love to know more about her immediately. Okay. So, Claire, Claire maybe you'd uh, contact uh, Turtle through his website and um, he'd be delighted yes. to hear from you about that. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, I'd love that. Uh, another question from Adrienne B. She says, do you think the Romans did us a favour by not coming over to Ireland? <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, did they do us a favour by not coming over? Uh, it made us a bit different to everybody else, that's for sure. Um, I would, um, we'd have straight roads, we'd have straight roads. That's, that's the, the, the biggest benefit. Um, they kind of did, as I say, they did, their impact did sort of come here. Um, that's a, that's a good question. I can't answer it's that. Yeah, it's an interesting one. It is an interesting one. Uh, Dez says, uh, read stories about women 
he'd recommend reading about the formidable Elizabeth Fitzgerald, great aunt of Jonah uh, Barrington. She didn't mess about in the 1609s. I'm not sure what, that, what that's about, Des, but uh, thank you very much for that tip. And uh, Jean Can asks, any mention anywhere on St. Nicholas grave in the middle of Ireland? Does that ring a bell? Yes, well, he's uh, Santi, uh, for ah. want of a better word, is um, supposed to be down in Jerpoint Abbey um, in, oh. uh, you know, in, uh, in Kilkenny, down on the banks of the River Nore. Um, and there is a tomb down there that is uh, said to be um, the remains of uh, St. Nicholas. Um, but, you know, obviously it can't be Santa because Santa doesn't die. Santa, mm. you know, he's a magical being. Um, but um, it is, yes, St. Nicholas's tomb is apparently uh, in the ruined church of St. Nicholas down at uh, Jerpoint Abbey. Okay. okay. And David Freeman asks, anything about Lithuanian Jewish immigrants to Ireland and episodes such as the Limerick Pogrom? Um, not about the Limerick Pogrom. Uh, have the, is the Lithuanians mentioned in this? I have, I've covered the story of the Lithuanian Jews before. It is absolutely fascinating. Um, no, that'll have to go in the sequel as well. <laughs> There are, uh, okay. there's, there's, there's 36 stories in the book, um, so, um, yeah. and you know, the vast majority of them take place uh, in the sort of 16th and 17th and 18th century. Okay, we're, we're getting close to the end, I think, sort of we let you go, uh, have your uh, uh, Friday night uh, supper, whatever you're having. Uh, Susan said, read your account with the big win, terrifying and excellent. One question off topic. Uh, would you have any idea if there was a small dock next to Custom House before George's dock was built? I can answer that if you can't. If there was. There was. Yeah. There was, yeah. Uh, the, the, there was a dock right below where the, um, the, I mean, there's plenty of little docks that have disappeared, but James Gandon built one, didn't he, yeah. that we now drive over. Um, That's right, yeah. You remember where it is, Brendan, exactly? It's, it's I think it would be where is it Memoria Road is, uh, just uh, between what is now the, you know, the Custom House and what is now the IFC, mm. and it leads onto the bridge, onto the Matalga Bridge. There was a dock there originally. And in fact, if, if, uh, just to say to people, if you look on the festival website, there is a talk uh, on the, uh, Royal Irish Acad from the Royal Irish Academy, which deals with this very area and shows the maps uh, showing that dock. Uh, yeah, it's very, it's very interesting. So if you drive over the Matt Talbot Bridge in Dublin, you're, you're, uh, you're effectively driving over the dock uh, just before you get to the bridge. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting, yeah. All well, that whole area, amazing. Yeah. Uh, that was nearly going to be a chapter in this book. God, I'm definitely going to have to write a sequel. Oh, you well. are. No, no question about it. <laughs> and I just, uh, uh, Cartaldo Boyle just mentions that uh, Dr. Adrian treated Lord Edward Fitzgerald after his capture, and he was a Huguenot descendant. So... Okay, very good. Okay. Okay. Well, look, folks, it's, um, it's uh, 1959, so we're just coming up on to uh, eight o'clock. Uh, I want to thank, obviously, thank uh, Turtle for a fascinating talk and giving us all uh, more things to look up and places to travel to. As I mentioned, uh, Turtle's books are all available at your local library, but our festival uh, partner bookshop, as usual, is the Gutter Bookshop, uh, thegutterbookshop.com. They'll be happy to supply all of your uh, reading needs. We've lots more events coming up in the festival over the weekend. Uh, tomorrow, for example, Saturday, we have Cormac Moore talking about the road to partition. That's at 2 p.m. At 7 p.m., we have Anne Applebaum talking to none other than the Minister for Finance, Pascal Dunahu, uh, about her very important and very relevant book, The Twilight of Democracy. Uh, any of us who look at what's going on around the world today, this is a really, really, really important book. On Sunday, uh, Marita Connell and McKenna, the wonderful author, will be here at 4 p.m. talking about the Great Famine. And then at 7 p.m. on Sunday, we have Philippe Sands. He'll be talking about his wonderful book, The Rat Line, on the trail of a Nazi fugitive. If you haven't heard that story, it is really, really fascinating and well worth uh, tuning in for that. Full details all on the website at dublinfestivalofhistory.de. So uh, it just remains for me, on behalf of the festival, on behalf of Dublin City Council, indeed, I want to thank uh, Turtle once again for uh, giving us his time and his expertise on a really entertaining evening. And I want to thank all the audience so much for, and for all the great questions. And we hope to see you more, uh, at more events rather, from the Dublin Festival of History. And I uh, hope you all have a nice weekend. We'll see some of you tomorrow and on Sunday. And Turtle, good luck with the next book. We look forward to, to, to seeing it. Bye-bye now. Okay, good night, everybody. <laughs>